sleep and make the flowers for a couple of hours on a beautiful day. You might be wondering why I was staring at a flickering screen. And it's not because I was trying to give myself a seizure. That was actually a brain computer interface. Yes, it's exactly what you're thinking about. The same brain computer interface was used by Neuralink to allow a paralyzed individual to type using just their thoughts. So, uh, it, it's, uh, yeah, so, um, the monkeys actually enjoy doing the demos because they, and, and they get what they're When I saw this demo, I thought it was extremely cool. And so I wanted to see if I could recreate it at home in my bedroom. So, I can't necessarily recreate the Neuralink, and that's because number one, I can't perform the surgery on myself, and number two, I don't have billions of dollars at my disposal along with a team of engineers. What I can do is use a simpler BCI paradigm as well as some more affordable hardware. This is the Neuropond Biopotential Kit. It's the affordable hardware that I developed for this project. I'm going to be using it to extract brain signals so that we can make inference on them. A BCI paradigm is just a method of interpretation of brain signals. Brain signals that come from EEGs or electroencephalograms. These are devices which measure the electrical activity in the brain. And we can use an EEG to extract signals from the brain and then use them for interpretation. There are a multitude of different BCI paradigms, some of which include motor imagery, P300, and in my case, SSVEP or steady state visually evoked potentials. Let's assume there's a monitor flashing black and white at a specific frequency and I was looking at that monitor. When I do this there's a strange phenomenon that occurs where the neurons at the back of the head start flashing at the same frequency of the monitor. We can leverage this to create a brain computer interface because we can command where we look. If we command where we look, we can essentially cause the neurons in the back of the head to fire at whatever frequency we're looking at. This is in essence how SSVEP works. So when I wear an EEG cap, I'll be able to decipher what I'm looking at. I can do this when I analyze the brain signals in the frequency domain. I'll see a peak at 7 hertz and its harmonics, indicating that I'm looking at a 7 hertz frequency. So. How am I going to make this SSVEP BCI? Well, I think I can break it down into three steps. The first is data collection. I need to know what device I'm going to use and where I'm going to place the electrodes. Second is signal processing. I need to filter out the AC line noise so that I actually have a clean signal I can work with. Three is classification. I can take in this filtered EEG data and then try and predict what me, the user, is trying to do. So let's get started. After endless hours of coding, as evidenced by my scrolling, I made this program to record some data. There's a pre-stimulus, stimulus, and post-stimulus time amounting to five seconds in total for each trial. There are gonna be eight channels recording from the back of the head. Let's go through some of the code that I totally didn't use ChatGPT to create. So I ended up using a bandpass filter from 3 hertz to 48 hertz, as well as two fourth order Butterworth filters for the 50, 60 hertz line noise. Uh, this should give us a clean signal. For the classification, I have a bunch of traditional and ML based approaches that I'm putting in a grid search. I think the support vector machine, the SVC classifier is going to be the best. So we'll see. I don't know if this is going to work or not. There we go. Yeah, so you can see it's flashing. Um, and I did some pre preliminary testing. I used four frequencies, 6.67, 7.5, 8.57, and 10. And uh, what I realized was the classification accuracy was like 20%. It was horrible. And so what I wanted to do was just double check that the frequency that was being displayed is the actual true frequency. So if we say it's 8.57, is it actually 8.57? So I made this tiny Arduino contraption uh, with just a photoresistor and I, I'm gonna test it soon. 
Turns out the frequencies that I wanted to display weren't accurate, and so this caused the poor results that I was seeing. So now the search begins for a program that's going to allow me to display frequencies more accurately. And this program is called PsychoPy because I'm a psycho and I'm using Python. It has a mode where I can export my experiment to a Python script. In this Python script, I'm going to add my recording functionality so I can grab data from the nightboard. The best accuracy I got was 56%, which is not good. So uh, what I'm going to do is go look at some papers, maybe, and see if I can find what other people have done and try and recreate it. After hours of research, I found this one paper which made a high-speed BCI speller using SSVEP. And they use a specific signal processing technique called TRCA, or Task Related Component Analysis. And so I'll go into the three blue, one brown explanation of how this works. Task Related Component Analysis. Wait, something doesn't seem right. Ah, that's much better. TRCA extracts task related components by applying a weighted spatial filter to multi channel data. The result is inter channel covariance is decreased. This essentially means that channels in multi-channel data start to look more and more like each other. This is especially important in SSVEP where the signals are reproducible. In this example, the TRCA component is extracted from the original multi-channel data and it's seen in yellow. This significantly increases the signal to noise ratio which allows us to extract more useful features from the signal. So I made the program show me the frequency I'm supposed to look at uh, in PsychoPy. And I randomized the frequency so that the spatial filter doesn't learn the order I'm looking at the, like the order of which I'm looking at the stimuli. Cause that's what was happening before and I was getting pretty poor results. But I think it should be good. And I also adapted it so that it records data while I'm looking at the stimuli. Here I am confirming whether or not the electrodes are in the right place and are actually touching my scalp. I'm doing this by clenching my jaw and closing my eyes. So in this sped up clip, I'm showing you a sampler recording. The top left is 6.67. The bottom left is 10 Hertz. Top right is 8.57 and bottom right is 12 Hertz. The order at which I look at these frequencies is randomized every trial. So this is amazing results. As you can see, I'm bidding 97.5% mean accuracy. I recorded 10 trials and uh, I used a one fold cross validation. So I used one of the trials as a test and then nine as the uh, training for the spatial filter. And you can see it's really, really quick. This is uh, this 5.9 seconds. So this is really, really good. I think we can go on and do a real world test. The purpose of this project wasn't just to test the performance of my BCI in Python. No, I wanted to actually interact with the external world. And what better way to do that than Minecraft? My goal is going to be to get through this maze using just the brain computer interface without actually touching the keyboard. For clarity, this is how my SSVEP interface is going to look like. I'm going to have four commands up, down, left and right, each corresponding to a different flickering box. When I, for example, look at the box labeled right, the computer is going to detect this and it's going to move my character right in the game. Given the limited number of samples I used to train my spatial filter, commands should be interpreted correctly 98% of the time. Finally, I'm done yapping. Time for an actual test. So here I am just setting up the program, turning on Minecraft, and waiting for the nightboard to initialize. Here I was looking at the top left because I coded that to go forward. And uh, as you can see, it's working. And then I eventually need to go right. So I start looking at the bottom right because that makes the player go right and it gets stuck. And this, this is the face of someone who's done. After some reflection, I realized that I kept looking at the top left, but none of my training data had 
trials where I only looked at the top left over and over again. So I went back and added four trials where I only looked at the top left and I did this for every single frequency. So there was 16 in total. Training the filter once again, the accuracy dropped down to 89%, but this should be okay. It should allow us to get through this maze. So I have Minecraft open on the left screen and on the right screen I have the interface. Some of you may be wondering why I didn't put Minecraft on the main interface and that's because the spatial filter is really, really sensitive. And so if I were to change any of the parameters while I'm testing it, it probably wouldn't work. This proved to be a bad idea because I was trying to look at the game out of the corner of my eye while also focusing on the main interface, which caused me to keep turning my head. This was bad because I think it dislodged some of the electrodes, which is why you see me readjusting my posture every so often. I tried to have the keyboard in the shot so you could see I'm actually using the brain computer interface to control the game. Uh, I'm also not doing any cuts, so you can see it's no, there's no trickery here, I'm just speeding up the video. I think I could improve on this project in a couple of ways. The first is the amount of data I use to train the spatial filter. TRC is very sensitive, so when you present it with real world examples that don't exist in the training data, it usually performs very poorly. I think this was happening in my case, but I just couldn't get around it because of the timeline of the project. In the future, I'd collect more data and get specifically more of those edge cases so that I would be able to achieve better performance when training. The second is the signal processing algorithm. In the future, I'd love to add a machine learning model or some other classical technique adjacent to TRCA so that I can improve the performance and accuracy. The third improvement is actually putting the game Minecraft or whatever it is in the main interface. This would improve the usability because I wouldn't have to look left and right at different monitors and potentially risk adding movement artifacts to the signal. What do you guys think of the project? Do you think it was good? Do you think it was bad? Do you think there's some things that could have improved on or some things that you liked? Leave your comments and thoughts down below and leave a like and subscribe. I'll see you guys next time.